Okay, it says I'm live. I believe I'm live, and uh, so I certainly feel alive. So uh, excellent to see all of you, or hear all of you, or read your comments, whichever one, probably the latter. Uh, so folks are joining. Glad to see you. Um, uh, we'll give everybody about a minute to arrive while I do brief introductory stuff, but so that you know you're at the right place. This is the Squirrel Squadron, my community of tech and non-tech people uh, learning together, uh, executives figuring out how to handle all that crazy technology, all those mad things that uh, people are doing. While you're coming in, uh, I'd like you to tell me where are examples where uh, uh, estimation is really hard for you. Uh, and it could be in your sales team. It doesn't have to be in technology. But uh, where are you really struggling to get a uh, uh, an estimate that's effective? It might be you can't get uh, an estimate at all. Whoever you're asking for an estimate isn't doing a good job of getting you one, and, and you're waiting. Or it could be that you're asking for an estimate, you get an answer, and you don't believe it. Uh, yeah, we can complete that this week. Don't worry. Really, this week, really, Friday comes and goes. It's not ready. So any of those circumstances, I'd like to hear from you. Throw it in the chat. Uh, that's where I can see your comments and respond. Uh, so I'm interested in where you're really struggling with estimates because uh, an awful lot of my clients are. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know me, I'm Squirrel. I'm the chair of the Squirrel Squadron and a consultant and expert in um, uh, helping tech teams be insanely profitable. The Squirrel Squadron is my community of, uh, of folks learning together how to do that. And uh, if you're interested in uh, learning more about that, stick around because uh, I have a bunch of ideas about that. So uh, would love to see your, your comments and thoughts uh, and arguments as we go. I'm going to try to be as provocative as I possibly can and uh, tell you things that uh, don't, don't agree with the, uh, uh, what you read in books, um, with uh, the, the received wisdom. So uh, let's get started with, uh, with some of that as soon as I mention um, just a couple of the events that are coming up. So I do these every week. Uh, they're live streams. They're Zoom calls. I had a very successful in-person event last week. We were doing improv theater and learning how that helped us uh, build better products. So uh, lots of these things are happening. I'm going to be in Berlin and Vienna in the next few weeks, Miami after that. Um, and uh, lots of opportunities to talk about uh, how to get your tech and non-tech people working effectively together. So happy to see you there. I should mention I'm also running a workshop at the end of November, and that's all about my concepts around strategy. How do you build a tech strategy? How do you make objectives? How do you actually make these crazy OKR things and 4DX, and I can never keep track of the latest acronyms. Uh, how do you make those work for your tech team as, as opposed to uh, against them? Because uh, an awful lot of times the objectives seem very rapidly out of date and not very effective. How can you do that effectively to keep your tech team actually building what you need? Okay, so uh, that's stuff that's coming up on the squadron. So uh, I want to talk about uh, estimates and why you should never use them. Get rid of estimates. You don't need them. Now, I'm going to do uh, something that I estimated would take me about one minute, and uh, the visuals will definitely confirm that. Uh, this is what I call the tilted slider. So I hope you can see that OK. This is my high tech uh, screen sharing in operation. But you know what? I didn't need very long to create this. And uh, it gets my point across uh, very effectively. Let me describe what it is. Uh, this is a tilted slider. So uh, if you've uh, used an old time radio, um, you'll remember that they had these little things that you can move back and forth, and it would control um, what uh, station you were tuned to. Uh, well, that's what one of these is, except somebody's managed to turn it sideways. So uh, why on earth would anybody turn a slider sideways? Well, because they want to make a point. And the point I want to make is that there's a difference between productivity up here, you know, my clever uh, uh, descriptions here, uh, and predictability. And uh, there's some trade-off between the two. So I see a lot of technology teams that um, really optimize for being as predictable as possible. They never want to surprise anybody. And um, those teams are usually pretty slow. My favorite example of a team that operates that way is NASA. So if you're um, uh, working at NASA and uh, you want to build uh, the rocket they keep trying to launch, I think they haven't actually managed to launch it yet. Um, so if you're trying to build one of those, you're going to find yourself here at the bottom of the tilted slider at the predictability end for a really good reason, because you want to be as predictable as possible so your rocket will launch at the right time and get to the moon. Right? So they're always trying to make sure they do the countdown at just the right time, make sure that they're predictable about when the uh, liquid oxygen is loaded into the fuel tank and everything else. That's the same as your tech team uh, working very hard to get exactly the right number of story points. Uh, your designers making really wonderful wireframes, low fidelity, high fidelity, user research, lots of things go into making sure, just like the NASA folks, make sure that their um, uh, preparations are right on time. 
making sure that your tech team actually gets things done the way they say they will. That sounds really valuable. That sounds like the thing you want. I'm here to claim that it isn't because you're not NASA. So here's the big difference. If you're uh, uh, building a rocket ship and you launch the rocket ship at the, lo at, uh, the wrong second, right? One second early, one second late, you're gonna miss the moon. You won't hit the launch window. You won't use the right amount of fuel. I'm no rocket scientist, but you need to be accurate. And that's why NASA, for example, NASA software developers produce 100 lines of code per year, per developer. They're incredibly slow and careful because if you launch the rocket the wrong way, you lose the rocket millions and millions of dollars. Um, you, you get defunded. Who knows what else happens to you? Um, so it's extremely important that you wind up, if you're building a rocket, down here at the predictability end. But there is lots that happens in between the product productive and the predictability ends of this slider. There's lots of things you can do to move the slider. And uh, it's actually very valuable to think about who exists up here at this end. Who's super productive and isn't that worried about whether things are done on time, whether they're exactly what the customer ordered, who, who's kind of sloppy that way and very successful? Well, the answer you might think of is startups. If you're building a startup rather than a rocket ship, Probably nobody has any idea how your software should work. Nobody knows what the right answers are. They're just not known by humans. Um, there is some answer out there. There's something that's going to be a more successful e-commerce application or a more successful rocket ship even. Um, but nobody knows what it is. And the way to get there is by experimenting. But that is inherently not a predictable exercise. So startups are usually perfectly happy not knowing what they're going to do next week, as long as what they're doing today is really valuable. And this is the seed of the key idea that can get you out of using estimates. Now, none of you put anything in. If you if you do want to, I would love to respond to your examples. Uh, Jez, I know, I don't know if he's here, but on the forum, he was uh, posting uh, some very helpful examples. I forgot to mention my, my Squirrel Squadron forum. We discussed there as well uh, in between events. And, and Jez said, well, look, um, we, we like to do uh, estimates. We, we do it when we can, when we can do it quick, when the investment is small. And that makes sense. I'm going to return to that idea. But um, what uh, so many of you are doing is building very, very careful edifices, castles in the sky. Um, you're existing down here at the predictability end of the tilted slider. And there's a reason you're doing that, which I haven't talked about yet. It's the reason the slider is tilted. Why didn't I just draw it as a normal slider like a re regular radio squirrel? What, what, what idea are you trying to get across? The point is there's a force of gravity. And the force of gravity is the desire for control. So what happens is people in the organization, they're often non-technical people who, for very understandable reasons, don't really know what's going on. Us technologists, we talk very uh, abstrusely with complicated language and jargon. Um, uh, we work on things. We say, leave us alone. We'll tell you when we're done. Uh, uh, and non-technical people often feel that they don't have control. They don't know what's going to happen. They can't predict. Well, guess what they do? They try to move the slider down. They say, can you give me the story points? Can you tell me the velocity? Can you show me uh, uh, how long it's going to take? Exactly how many engineers? What are the steps going to be in whatever it is that you're building? How are we going to deliver this? And this makes lots of sense. This is very natural, normal behavior. The pro and it works perfectly well for NASA because people at NASA really do actually legitimately need to be on time, right? If you're not on time, if you don't launch the rocket at the right time, you're going to be in trouble. The thing is, in almost all our industries, if anybody is here from the nuclear industry, or um, I don't know, maybe you're, you're making uh, safety critical pacemakers that go inside human beings, maybe you should move down here to this predictable end. I'll, I'll buy that. Most of us do not need to be there. And we push ourselves way too far down. I can't make this go the right direction. There we go. This this way. I think I'm doing it right. They, we push ourselves way too far down toward the predictable end rather than um, accepting that, hey, a little bit less predictability could really help us. So uh, have a think. Where do you fit on the predictability versus um, uh, productivity scale? And uh, uh, let me know in the uh, comments there if you think that's... Um, uh, uh, something where you're not placed correctly. Maybe you think you should be more predictable. That would be really interesting. I'd be happy to debate that here. If nobody debates and argues with me, this will be a shorter stream, but that's okay with me too. I don't mind. I'm having fun and I hope that you are. Okay. So uh, let me bring up my notes here. I just had them and they disappeared off my screen. Slightly inconvenient. There they go. Right. So that's the tilted slider. Um, and I hope you find that idea helpful um, for kind of capturing why it is that you might feel you need estimates. Um, but uh, I imagine some of you are saying, 
Squirrel, you're telling me that my estimates aren't true, and uh, you haven't really backed up that claim. And you tell me that I don't really need them. You tell me I could be more productive. Well, yeah, I could, but what would I do instead, right? So uh, I need to know something. I, I need some way of knowing that my technology team is doing something. The reason I have that desire for control, the reason I'm sliding the slider down, is exactly that my uh, tech team isn't telling me enough. I don't know what's happening. Um, and whether I'm a CTO or a CFO or um, somebody else uh, in or outside the tech team, if I don't know what's happening and what's uh, what the team's going to do well or poorly, if we're on time or not, uh, I can't judge whether to give them more resources, whether to change priorities. I, I don't know what to do. So my estimates help me even though they're imperfect. And if you're saying that, you're absolutely correct. The thing is that there are better methods, which is what I'm going to spend most of the, the rest of the time talking about. Let me just bash estimates uh, uh, slightly longer um, by, by uh, remarking that uh, they are woefully, woefully bad. And it's shocking to me that you know, there's only a few other things that are quite as mythical in business uh, as, um, uh, as, as technology estimates. One, one of the chief ones is sales estimates. And we actually have a, a kind of um, folk uh, approach to sales estimates. If you think about, um, or if you go and talk to anybody who, who manages salespeople, if you really nail them, get them down the pub, get a few drinks in them, um, they'll say, yeah, we make predictions. And we say, you know, how many are at what stage and how many phone calls do we need to make in order to get this many sales? And in our Salesforce records, yeah, we have a record that says how many are at this stage, how many are this far along, uh, how, what's the predictability of close, right? Uh, how, how likely is it that this um, sale will go through? And nobody believes these numbers. It's actually um, uh, kind of a running joke. It's kind of a standard thing that people say, you got to cut all those in half, or you got to cut all those in, in fourths. You got to make it 25% smaller. And um, uh, it, it is a known fiction. And, and people just correct for it. They just say, well, look, salespeople are optimistic. That's why they're good salespeople. So, okay, we're going to cut everything uh, in half before we believe anything the salespeople say. The problem is that in technology, it's actually worse. You can't just cut it all in half. We're not always too optimistic. Sometimes our estimates are way too high. Sometimes they're way too low. Much more often, they're um, uh, uh, way too low so that we're, we're missing by being late because we find things that we didn't didn't think of. So like the salespeople, we're, we're too optimistic. Um, but um, most often it's more a random uh, random factor. And anybody who, who does this will know that the effort that you put in to estimate and get story points right and figure out what the um, right burn up chart or burn down chart looks like and whether you're on track or not, a lot of this is fake. A lot of this is not um, actually giving you any um, management information that you can act on. Uh, because it's just too random. Human beings are not good at predicting their own behavior. If we were, we'd be robots and maybe we'd be a lot more successful. So if you build a robot that can build software, please talk to me. I'd be interested in, in checking it out. Until then, we're stuck with humans. And humans are really bad at estimating, especially in complex unknown environments. And guess what? That's exactly what software is, especially when you're building something new, as you almost always are. So um, that's that's me bashing estimates and telling you why they're really useless. Um, I still haven't told you how we're going to replace them, what we're going to do instead. Um, Aiden says, uh, I worked at places where the policies of around estimation could only by, be satisfied by never releasing anything. Fantastic. Thank you. I'm going to put that up because that's really good. Aiden, I really like that. Thank you. Um, and you know, I'm, I agree with Aiden. I have exactly the same experience that um, if you were to spend as much time as some people would like you to estimating, you'd spend all your time estimating. And therefore, you would never get anything done. Another reason why estimates are a complete waste of time, why uh, we, we should do our very best to do something else. OK, well, let me start talking about what else you can do by talking to you about elephants. So imagine that you have an elephant. And um, for some very bizarre reason, you want to slice this elephant into pieces. I'm a vegetarian, so this analogy is particularly painful for me, but um, I imagine you can deal with it. So we're going to take our elephant. And we're going to slice it into pieces. And what we want is for these very, very thin slices uh, that we're going to make of the elephant, we want it to look kind of like an elephant. We want to be able to, to look at each piece as we work with it and say, yeah, this piece, you know, it's, it's representing an elephant. And actually what we're going to be doing, you can think of it more as building up an elephant if we're maybe uh, carving an elephant or making an elephant statue. And we're going to make it out of slices. Um, and we want to be able to see as we build up the elephant, 
it looks more and more like an elephant as we go. So we're going to take all these little pieces and, and make an elephant. So here is a really dumb way to accomplish this goal. Let's take the elephant, and I'm going to ask you to imagine here I'm screen sharing again. The elephant is standing here in front of me. Here's its trunk over here, and here's its back, and here's its legs. And a really dumb way to make uh, an elephant out of uh, slices would be to slice it horizontally. And if I did that, imagine what I'd get. Well, down here, I'm going to get four circles, right? I'm going to get the what do you call them, paws or feet? I'm not sure what an elephant has, the, 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 the lower part of the legs of an elephant. And it's going to look like four circles. That's not going to look very much like an elephant. And then I'm going to have a slice through the middle. Well, that's going to look like a big um, blob, right, uh, the body of the elephant. Maybe I'll get a little piece of the trunk over here. Um, and, and that's not going to look very much like an elephant. And when I get to the very top, I'll get just a little tiny bit, the, the kind of top of its back. And that doesn't look like an elephant. Okay, this isn't a very good way to build up an elephant if you want it to look like an elephant as you're going. Once you get all done, if you're building up your elephant from all these slices, yeah, you'll get something that's an elephant, but you won't be able to tell as you go. The smarter way, which probably most of you have figured out, is that I'm going to slice it vertically. I'm going to slice it this way. And then every time I'm going to get essentially a silhouette of an elephant. Yeah, I'll be really close to myself, I might not get the legs. Um, in the middle, I might kind of miss the legs. But I'm going to kind of get most of the slices are going to be a couple of legs, a kind of big blob for the middle of the elephant, the tail, and the, and the trunk. And so I'm going to get something that looks like an elephant as I go. Okay, now why on earth am I telling you this? Don't worry, I'm not asking you to dissect any elephants. Um, but this is a concept from Alistair Coburn. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you how to spell Alistair Coburn, by the way, because um, it is not obvious. Um, and the CK is silent in his name for reasons that, uh, that you can probably guess. Um, and uh, Alistair had this idea long ago as he was trying to explain how he built software really effectively. Sorry if you can hear my dog. Uh, dog's really excited about uh, elephants and, and Carpaccio as well. He said, well, um, what you could do is you could slice the piece of work that you're doing into really small pieces. That's what I do, Alistair Coburn, in order to build software really well. And um, when I do that, um, uh, the analogy I'll use is um, building up an elephant from lots of slices, each of which looks like an elephant. And what the analogy means is that Alistair figured out how, and, and your team actually already know, I'll talk about that in a second, how to build software in tiny, tiny, tiny pieces, each of which adds up to the, the full picture and looks like the picture as it goes. Let me explain this because this analogy may be hard to see. Imagine that I, um, uh, and I actually have a, uh, a simple example from, from my history in, in FinTech. Um, imagine one of these spreadsheets, you might know that um, finance people create one of them that's extremely long, you know, it has columns X, Y, M, uh, 72. I didn't know columns could go that long until I got into to finance. I didn't know there were that many columns in a spreadsheet. So very, very complex spreadsheet with lots of mistakes in it. And, and we were replacing this thing. We had this in our, um, uh, our client had it and they said, build us a system that actually works. And we'll actually believe that, you know, we won't mess up the cell X157 uh, so, and, and report the wrong numbers to our investors. We said, great, we'll work on that. But we started it in a very funny way, or at least it might seem funny if you don't know these concepts. Uh, the way we started it is that we built uh, a, a web page, and we're making a, a, a web application, and we made a web page in which we had typed in all the numbers. In other words, it showed a table that was like the spreadsheet, and you could move around on the table in a fairly standard web application way. And um, as, as you went around on it, you saw numbers, they didn't change. That's not very useful. In fact, what we'd done is just looked at the spreadsheet and we just typed in all the numbers that were on the spreadsheet. We copied them over. And then we showed it to them and they said, wow, you're all finished. This is amazing. But wait a minute, the numbers aren't changing. We said, yeah, yeah, yeah we're nowhere near finished. But we wanted to show you what your spreadsheet currently shows and we're going to improve this over time. And they said, well, yeah, this looks like our application. But, you know, some of those numbers are wrong. This one is incorrect and this one should be bigger than that one. So we said, slow down, slow down, tell us what that is. And we said, yeah, your, your current spreadsheet has this information. They said, oh, our spreadsheet's wrong. Good. So we wrote down what was wrong with it. Then our next step, our next slice, this was our first slice. It looked like the elephant. It looked like what we wanted to build. Our next slice was to change one number. And that number was now dynamic. It would actually update. It would actually calculate something. It would add numbers together, whatever it was supposed to do. And we said, yeah, one of these numbers is actually changing. Here it is. This is the one that's changing. Um, it, is it correct? And they said, no, of course it's not. And we said, great. Tell us again. What's wrong with that? So we fixed that number. And then we made another number alive. And then we made another number live. 
we kept adding and we had a whole column lot where we kept making more and more of the spreadsheet um, do what they wanted it to do. And at every moment they could give us feedback. And of course we could do this very quickly. So we were way up on the tilted slider. We were way up at the productivity end. We were operating um, very, very quickly, but we couldn't predict what would happen because we never knew if we'd go see them. They'd say, no, the new column you added completely wrong, got to do it again. We thought that was really good because what we were trying to do was understand this spreadsheet and get really rapid feedback. If you heard me talk about the OODA loop, and that's another uh, window on this same idea. We we're trying to get as much information as we could as quickly as we could. And we built this up over time uh, with a number of very small slices, each of which looked like what we were trying to build. I'll give you another example. Um, had a client who wanted to build a, um, uh, a color picker. So on their application, they wanted to, um, they may be here actually, if Tom's here, hi Tom. Um, but um, they, they wanted to build something so that their graphs in their application, they make beautiful graphs, um, uh, would, could be changed uh, in color, one particular set. And instead of kind of going and building the whole color picker, what they did first was they put up a button uh, and uh, they uh, you click the button and nothing would happen, but it said color picker on it. Now that looked just a tiny bit like the elephant they wanted. In other words, you had the button and they just counted how many people clicked the button. Some of you are immediately thinking this would never work. We can't do this. It, it would cause angst. It doesn't cause as much angst, much angst as you think, but it worked in their situation at least. And, and they uh, counted a lot of people clicked the button. Some people complained. They said, great, could we get your name? Can we phone you right when we build this? Um, so then they built the next bit, which was when you click the button, you got a picture, a literally a JPEG. It didn't change at all. If this sounds like the spreadsheet I was describing, that's right. Um, so it was a, a picture of a color picker, you know, the wheel with the different colors in it, and you can click one and it changes. You'd be clicking all day, nothing would happen. This was a static picture. But they were then able to watch some of these users, some of the ones who complained and other people, and they'd say, where did you click? And why did you want to do that? And what do you hope will happen when you do this? And um, those users were forgiving and, and kind and told them more about what was needed. And so then they made it so that when you clicked on it, it actually changed a color. So you could uh, actually go to, uh, to see a color change, but it didn't do, have any effect yet. <laughs> it wasn't saved. So you'd see that you picked red and you see red there and you click save. And, nothing would happen and your graph wouldn't change color, but at least you could start to see the interaction. You could start to see what they were expecting and, and how it was going to work. And they continued in this way until they actually built up the whole elephant, the whole mechanism of changing colors and updating colors and saving them and everything else. So this is the notion of elephant carpaccio. And some of you may not know how to spell elephant carpaccio. Uh, carpaccio. Uh, so we'll spell that in case uh, that's something that you need. Um, and uh, this idea from Alistair Coburn ha has worked really well for lots of my clients. You don't have to do it this way. So um, it, often when I'll describe this to people, I'll say, release a new thing every day to your real customers and get feedback from them. Every day, oh my God, I can't believe it. What are you talking about, Squirrel? You must be nuts. Uh, you don't have to do it at quite that rate. So um, you don't have to do it in quite the way I described. But the idea is, as uh, Roger was just remarking, um, thank you, Roger, I'm going to get to other comments, but I just caught yours. Um, it's iteration. Most teams re revert to incrementalism. Yes, um, it, that's a very, very insightful notion. What, what you're trying to do is to make sure you're getting feedback at every stage, not just building up a fixed elephant, but you start building it and people say, that's not the picture I wanted. I was looking for a tiger. I was looking not for a color picker, but something that would pick the colors for me, for example. You want that kind of surprising feedback, and you want to understand better what your customers want. So very insightful comment. Thank you, Roger. Um, uh, so uh, if you're looking for that, if that would be valuable to you, if you would like to have um, significant productivity, then think about how you can move closer to that level of, um, uh, of performance. How could you get your team uh, to release uh, very frequently, get frequent feedback, be less predictable, and not have to estimate. And that's the point I want to make here is that uh, when you're working in this way or anything close to it, what you wind up with is frequent enough feedback that you know where the team is. And you don't have to wonder, well, gosh, if we keep going on this, uh, well, there were three steps we did, and we did every one of those steps in one day, and there are five steps left. We must be about five days from done. And because the slices are very small, uh, the estimates are much more accurate. You, almost anybody can say, you know, how long is it going to take me to do this if it takes a day? Take a week, take a month, take a year, much, much more difficult to be accurate. So you get a lot greater accuracy in any kind of estimate you do need. And a lot of the time you won't need one because you'll say, well, they're doing fine. They're on track. They're building what they need. 
I'm already getting some value. I can already make use of, say, the spreadsheet, with, which has some of the numbers right. And I know some of the numbers aren't right yet. But man, this column gives me the right answers. I better use that. So you get a lot of benefits from accelerating, iterating, and as Roger points out, um, uh, really iterating rather than just building up to a known outcome. So the other great thing that happens is that uh, sometimes you abandon what you're doing halfway through because you realize it's the wrong thing. And that saves you an awful lot of time. And it's tremendously productive to not build the wrong thing. So lots of arguments here for why this works well. Do you have to release every day so small that you know we have a button that doesn't work? No, you don't have to do that. But I uh, predict that almost all of you can uh, uh, work with your tech team, can look at what they're doing, and can say, you know, we're being too conservative here. We're too far down on the tilted slider. We are um, operating with too much predictability. We don't need as much estimation as we have. I'll tell you one example of somebody who did that um, in a surprising area. I was saying, don't try this with your nuclear plant, or if you're NASA, fair. But these guys are, were building a, a, essentially a medical device, something that would uh, do uh, in tests for humans um, to, to tell them uh, essentially whether they needed to cut off parts of their bodies. So kind of high consequence, right? You would think that this would be a place where you'd need an awful lot of testing. They would have to go through a lot of gates before it could get live. And that's true. Did they release new versions of this medical device every day? Absolutely not. That would have been dangerous. Um, we actually discovered it wasn't technically a medical device. It was um, important. It was uh, had medical safety implications, but there were further elements that allowed us to be more flexible and to make sure, for example, that there was a real medical device with more of the careful checks that was always used as a verifier for the medical device that the, the team was building, the, the medical tool that they were building. And that meant that, in fact, the compliance people said, you know, we really need a careful documentation of what you're doing. We need you to follow certain tests and certain checks. But, you know, instead of releasing every six months, which is what they were doing and driving the salespeople insane, that they couldn't get any feedback from customers, kept building the wrong thing, absolutely um, uh, horrendous situation, um, they moved to every two weeks. And that was revolutionary. Nobody else in this industry was doing anything close to that. And it meant they could be super responsive for this industry. So, that's just one example where if you're finding that um, you know, the estimates are painful, that you're spending, as one of my clients is, um, uh, 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 two to three developer days every single week in multiple backlog grooming sessions and, and other things that make me just cry. You can see I'm getting out my, my tissue where I'm going to cry for, uh, for just out, out of sadness for how much time is wasted in this. If you're wasting time like that, go and look at what you can do to speed up the, uh, in, the in iteration more than the incrementalism, but make sure that you're improving um, and you can see what the team is doing. You won't need as many estimates. You may need none. All right, so I'm going to stop and, and take some comments here. There's been some good ones coming in. Um, uh, Roger again says, uh, I find it helps to distinguish between estimating and estimates. I do find some value in estimating, while the estimates don't hold their value for long. Can't argue with you. I would like to reduce both and I'd like to make them much more um, uh, fluid and um, uh, easy to create. I want them to be cheap. I don't want to invest huge amounts of time in uh, the estimation process or in tracking all my estimates and making beautiful burn up charts and Gantt charts and other charts and people love this kind of stuff. And, and most of the time it's really not necessary if you are able to see the incremental progress as we've been talking about. So thank you, Roger, appreciate that. Uh, I have an, oh, uh, I'm having a dialogue with Roger here. I did realize these were all Roger. Uh, it's harder when you have downstream dependent systems or users that need training or regulatory environments, plant control systems, service center systems, medical devices. Uh, well, I was just talking about one of those. Um, and uh, yes, you're absolutely right, but you can do more than you think. So um, I'll talk more about that if you want, but uh, I just gave you an example, I think, uh, that's relevant to that. Great. I'd love for other comments as well. I'm happy to just chat with Roger as well. He's giving me good challenges and I'm enjoying it. Please feel free to come in in the chat and say, hey, wait a minute, Squirrel. That wouldn't work in my environment. We tried that here and we don't see how to do it. I'd love to do that, but this is my question. So uh, please come in with those if you want. If nobody asks me questions, we'll get done sooner. That's fine with me too. Um, so uh, where are we so far? So I've talked with you about the tilted slider. For anybody who came late, I will just remind you. It's uh, a slider where you can move the sliding up and down. I can't really do this on the screen very well. I want to go that way. There we go. Um, and you can move it to predictable or you can move it to productive. Um, most people tend, because they have a desire for control, to move it way too far down here to the predictable end. 
Um, and what can you do instead? Well, what you can do is um, release very quickly to real users in some models, in some way that makes sense for you and your environment. Um, and your situation may be very different. We can talk about the different cases and how you would do it. But ultimately, what you want is instead of estimating what are we going to do next month, next year, uh, next century, uh, what we're going to do is instead see the progress very, very rapidly, and then you can steer. Uh, one of the analogies I like to use here is that uh, this is like um, what you don't do uh, when you uh, go to the shop. You know, I'm probably going to drive to the shop after this and, and pick up some things that my family needs. I'm not going to say, now I'm going to drive 47.2 meters this way and make a right turn, and then I'm going to avoid the pothole by making a turn. I don't do all those things. I get in my car and I start driving, and I say, oh, there's a pothole there. I'm going to go around it. I say, oh, there's road works. Let me take a different road. Oh, uh, I've detected that the light is red. I'm going to come to a stop that's going to delay me slightly. I get that very frequent feedback from actually driving the car and observing and looking out the window. If for some reason I had to get in a car and drive it around without being able to see, I might need to make that kind of careful plan. Back to NASA, that's what they do with rovers on Mars, right? They have to make very careful plans. They say, we're going to move this far and then this bit. It's because the speed of light means that it takes quite a long time to get the information back and forth. The rover can't uh, get rapid enough feedback, and therefore you need to make a much more careful plan for what to do. You're not driving a rover. You're not building a, a spaceship. You're not building a nuclear plant, almost certainly. So um, you can probably get by with much less than you think you'd, uh, you, you can in the area of estimation. Um, Aiden says, oh, great question. Good, challenging one, Aiden. I appreciate it. Um, is velocity a lie? It is based on real life, but how do we know if a velocity is good or bad? Well, here's my thoughts on velocity. So first, let's define it for people who might not know. Um, velocity is um, a measurement, usually in terms of something called story points or something like that. It's a measurement of how much uh, work the team got done in the last so much. Uh, often we talk in terms of sprints, um, but you could say velocity per week or per day or per month or something like that. And you say, how much did we get done? And you, you make up this is a key point. I'm going to come back to it. You make up this measure uh, called a story point. You can also try to say, well, how many hours did we do? How many features did we build? The problem is there's not a nice unit. It's not like laying bricks. And you can say, you know, each brick is the same size and we laid this many bricks in an hour. So it'll take us this many uh, uh, days to complete the wall. Unfortunately, software just isn't like that. So um, uh, as a substitute, uh, people have come up with this concept of velocity, and they'll say, OK, so for this team, uh, using the, the value of points that it uses for its um, uh, um, uh, 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 measurement of its work, um, uh, we will uh, calculate the velocity. And we'll say that in the last sprint, we got uh, seven points done, or we got 20, or 200, or whatever it is. But there's a terrible problem with velocity. Um, it, it's actually a very useful measure for the team. And so what I tend to say is velocity should stop at the door of the team's room. Of course, we're not all in rooms anymore, so we're a hot officer at home. But it should stop at the, the boundary of the, of the technology team that's building it with a, a group of uh, developers and designers and product managers and so on who are, who are building the piece of software. And the reason is it varies hugely across different teams even in the same uh, company, even in the same building, even uh, with the same people. So it might be that you have a team here made up of a group of people and you get most of them and you move them to a new team and their velocity is completely different. And the reason is what I noted before and I said I was gonna come back to, the measurement that you use is you're kind of building on sand. It's, it's um, a measurement that you make up. And you say, well, look, we're just gonna say this is a story point. Sometimes people try to say it's number of hours, number of days, but it really varies by team. Uh, hugely. And so there's no way to compare it across different teams, which is what people try to do. And Aiden very properly points out, hey, how do I know if this velocity is good or bad? You don't. Velocity is something that you can use within a team to help that team very locally, locally to that team and locally in time. In other words, in the next sprint, not 10 sprints from now or something like that. How, how, how might we get on? What should we plan for? What should we work on? Um, so if the team says, well, look, we usually do about 20. We've been getting a little better. So we've been scoring like 22 or 23, but let's be conservative. We think we can get 20. In our measurement, how much is this uh, work worth? How, much, how many story points is this going to take? Uh, well, it's going to take about 18. So it looks like a good chance that we'll get this set of work done in the next sprint. So we'll plan for that. It helps the team itself. You try to take it outside the team, and very bad things happen. So, uh, Aiden, I'd say velocity is not a lie within the team. 
it's a really useful measurement for the team. The mistake that everyone has made, I, I think in retrospect, I can remember when people were first talking about velocity, I, I, I didn't predict this, I should have. Um, it's very understandable that uh, uh, the un misunderstanding that would occur is that people say, oh, great, a measure. Finally, I have control. Hurrah, that's that desire for control coming back again. And, and they uh, uh, go and get the velocity from all their different teams. And they say, this team's better. This team's worse. I'm going to fire that team and promote that team. But then this team seems to be doing worse. And I move some people and suddenly, it's a, and, and this all kind of turns to, to ash in your hands. So um, uh, I'd strongly urge people to use velocity within your team if it works for them. It can be very helpful for them in getting a very local prediction of what they need, um, uh, what they should expect, how they should plan. Um, but if you try to use it any place outside, any place um, comparing two teams working on two different things, even two developers working on two different things, if you're small enough not to need teams, um, it can be very damaging. So it's a lie outside your team. I hope that's a helpful answer. Uh, please feel free to argue with me. I, I like it when people disagree. Uh, Rowan says, estimating is a great excuse for a conversation and to ask questions. It can help alignment. Well, Roland knows, I think, that I think I know you, Roland. Um, I, I, you're, you are um, dangling a uh, carrot in front of me. I wrote a whole book called Agile Conversations with my friend Jeffrey Frederick. So I, I'm addicted to conversations. So anything that um, helps us have more conversations, I'm down for it, believe me. So Roland, I completely agree with you that um, any excuse we can have to have a better conversation with our users, with product managers, with uh, salespeople, with anybody else who can tell us about how our product is doing is great. But um, what that's bringing me perfectly onto, and I promise I didn't pay Roland to ask this question, but Roland has brought me right on to the, the third point I want to make. And that is that there are other ways to get those conversations going. And I think they're superior. But just like velocity, they're often misused. So my favorite thing to get a conversation going is not to say, how, do I, how long do I think it will take in the future for this thing? and to have a conversation about that, but to say about the immediate past, something I know an awful lot more about. I know what has happened almost certainly accurately, much more accurately than I know about what's about to happen. So if I can talk about the immediate past um, by showing a demo, by just uh, uh, demonstrating and, and sharing what I've actually done, then I have get much of the same kind of conversation, questions, alignment, all the good things that Roland is pointing to. And I get it with much more factual basis. And of course, it may the conversation may then turn to, well, you've built a button here, and um, it's great. And I know that when it works, it will bring up the color picker that I want. But the button's in the wrong place. So I want you to move it. And, and then we might have a conversation about how hard it is to move, when I could move it, where we should move it, uh, what's involved, who we should ask, and so on. That would be a conversation about the future, which might get into some form of estimation. And I'm in favor of that. I don't mind that at all. But the grounding of the conversation should be, I just finished putting in the button. Man, it was more difficult than I thought. Buttons are hard. Maybe it's hard to move them. I have information that I can use, and maybe I can make suggestions about changing our design system so buttons are easier to change. Whatever it is, I might uh, I might be able to do it. So um, uh, uh, what my thesis here, my, my argument here for Roland is, I would much rather talk about what's there and by uh, having demonstrations, uh, user tests, whatever you want to call them. Um, with real users, and then I'm going to get the, the same benefits that I would get from an estimation conversation, but grounded in fact, rather than grounded on a lie, as estimates are. So you're very welcome to disagree with me, Roland. But I want to go on to another point, um, which is that um, there's something terrible that people sometimes do. It's a way that they kind of get the idea, like velocity, and then use it in the wrong way, and then the same unfortunate thing happens. What they'll do is they'll say, well, I'm going to do a tech demo. You know, what I did is I um, uh, created a new database table. That was my little slice. It didn't take me very long. I created the table. You know, it's, it's ready to go. Uh, I don't have a way to actually show it on screen or anything like that. But don't worry. I'll just have a demo for people, and I'll show them the table. Well, how will I show it? Well, I'll bring up a, a, an a, a entity relationship diagram, or I will bring up a, a, some SQL, and I will type things, and they will see things on the screen, letters and numbers. And that's a representation of the table as it's stored in the computer's memory or on the computer's disk. And um, uh, the problem with these, when people do these very technical demonstrations, is nobody cares. And nobody understands it. 
and, and uh, uh, a very unfortunate thing is that somebody will get the idea, yes, I should do things in small chunks, and I'm going to share it with people. And then they come back to me and they say, Squirrel, I shared it. And it, 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 I, I just was so excited about it. It was really wonderful. And I just got blank stares. And like have, most people left halfway through and like I didn't get any feedback. This demo stuff, this uh, elephant carpaccio, doing things frequently, it doesn't work. And if you're paying close attention, you will have picked up what mistake that person is making. And that is to slice the elephant horizontally. They're taking pieces that don't look like the final product. And there's lots of tricks here. Maybe I'll do a separate uh, session on this at some point. But there are lots of tricks for making sure that your slices actually look like what you want to build, or what the person actually wants to use, and that they're usable, that they're meaningful. So instead of building a database table, maybe you can do our spreadsheet trick that I talked about before. And there are lots of other ways, too. But you made a, a, a representation of the table in an actual web page, in an actual um, user interface. And maybe it doesn't have anything in it yet. Being blank would be fine. But you can say, are the columns right? Are the rows right? Is it in the right place? Um, are you finding, you know, is it uh, something that you can comprehend? Should it be bigger? Should it be smaller? There's lots of pieces of information that you can get from a user and have a very useful dialogue from a demo that is not just a pure tech demo, that is not showing off some piece of technology, but is showing some real value. And that's the measure that I'd suggest you use. So if you're thinking about how can I be more productive, how can I abandon estimates and get better feedback? then what I'd encourage you to do is to think about how can I show real value to customers, get those customers in front of it, and get their feedback, even if it's a tiny, tiny amount of value. Now, I'm going to come to some common objections to this in a minute, but I want to come to some questions. So here we go. Uh, a LinkedIn user, sorry, I don't always get the names of, of people who are um, uh, uh, commenting, uh, but somebody says, uh, think velocity definitely can be a lie. People avoid the risky, difficult, important stuff and keep going faster and faster the better they avoid it. Um, and I, I can um, imagine why, I'm not sure what you mean by going faster and faster, the better they avoid it. But certainly there are cases where people fib to themselves and they use velocity poorly. I'm not going to go into that. That's not my, my topic today. Maybe that's one I should do another time. Feel free to ask me for that. Um, come on the forum or drop me a note um, about how people misuse velocity or misuse lots of things in their development process. But velocity is really an internal metric. I'm talking here about making progress that customers see. So I'm going to continue focusing on that. But th this user isn't wrong in saying that you can mess up velocity too. <laughs> no question. Um, any suggestions for making people go towards the risky stuff? Well, I, I did write a whole book about it. I, I, I can certainly say a couple things now. Um, but um, uh, the, the thesis of Agile Conversations is that um, if you talked about the risky stuff, if we had conversations, as um, uh, Roland was uh, encouraging us to do, um, and if they were, if they had, it led to productive conflict, if people were unhappy but learned something, we would get places a lot faster. So can't argue with you at all that that's a valuable thing. Um, the thing I'd encourage you to do first is to ask um, uh, challenging questions, genuine questions, but challenging ones. Um, things like, um, could, could we uh, uh, think about how we can get that in front of a user more quickly? What could we do to um, make this thinner? Um, I've got a client I'm coaching on exactly this right now. And um, you know he made a long list of, of the things that we might do in small pieces. And I was challenging him, how can you make that thinner? How can you make that simpler? Um, instead of creating an entire database schema, how can you create one column and then show it on the screen so users can give you feedback? And, and that was a very helpful dialogue to have that helped him help his team uh, to move into more of this um, uh, rapid feedback, more productive style away from um, detailed estimates. So that's a very brief version. If you can ask more questions, LinkedIn user, so I don't know who it is. Um, if you can ask more questions and have a dialogue about um, what's possible, then that can unlock some, some latent knowledge in your technology team and help them to feel a little safer. Psychological safety is very important here. Um, that um, if you're asking about it, it's probably OK to discuss it. And it's probably OK to uh, admit that maybe this part's too risky, so we should do it in smaller slices. I'm happy to say more about that. Um, feel free to, to ask more. Uh, Aiden says, uh, thanks for great thoughts. Definitely going to remember and use the productivity predictability slider. Fantastic. Um, it's on page, I think, 147 of the book or something. I'm not trying to, to sell you the book, by the way. Uh, go to DouglasSquirrel.com and drop me a note, and uh, I will send you a copy of the book. I'd be happy to do that. Uh, I'm not trying to sell the books. That's what my publisher does. I want people to know this stuff. That's why I do the Squirrel Squadron. That's why I do these things for free. Um, right, so I want to come to one final point, um, which we, we uh, touched on um, from the, the user, the, the LinkedIn person who was uh, asking about doing the risky stuff. 
um, one thing I find is that your engineers already know how to do this. And if you go and ask them, they'll say, I have no idea, possibly. Um, but there's kind of latent knowledge in the backs of their brains. What do I mean by that? Um, well, there was this great thing called uh, stable diffusion. If you haven't looked this up, do, because it's a uh, fun to play with. Um, and it, uh, it's been released recently. It's a, kind of the, uh, the latest in a, a series of um, uh, evolutionary AI art um, uh, tools. And uh, the nice thing about it is it's open source. Other in other words, people can hack at it and change it and update it for themselves. Previous ones have been proprietary and commercial and a little more locked up. So um, in about a week uh, of this thing being released, it suddenly was making videos and um, had amazing user interfaces and it was integrated into every um, system you can imagine. Um, and uh, people were making, the, you, could, you could draw a cartoon picture of, a, of a, an elephant, for example. And what would come out of it is a beautiful, perfect, amazing picture of an elephant and then some other rubbish. So you have to sort through it, it's not perfect. But if you look at that, a whole bunch of engineers who were not constrained by having to estimate, by uh, calculating velocity, by doing backlog grooming, um, they were excited about something. They were super productive. Did they produce some, some real crap that wasn't really useful and, and try some things that didn't work? Of course they did. Um, but that didn't matter because they were independently working on something very exciting. And um, the explosion of uh, different uh, implementations, uses, um, ideas from stable diffusion is still going on. So uh, that's kind of an existence proof that engineers know how to do this. And if you take off the, the governors, kick off the brakes, give them the psychological safety to um, uh, uh, iterate very quickly, to make changes, get in front of users, get feedback. If you say, look, I don't care what the estimate is, get me a demo by Thursday, then first of all, they won't believe you. Uh, so uh, you have to kind of unlock this for them. What I find often is they say, well, what you want me to do is to, to give you lots of little pieces. I'll have to undo things. The customers will tell me that I'm doing it wrong and I'll have to throw something away. And you'll say, yeah, that's what I want. I do want you to throw away if you're doing the wrong thing, right? Go back to my car analogy. If I'm driving my car to the shop and I discover I'm going the wrong way, I should stop right away, not drive further that direction and then turn around. I should turn around right then as soon as I realize I'm on the wrong road. Similarly, your engineers will tell you, wait, this is going to take longer. I'll have to throw things away. You'll say, yeah, but it'll take shorter if you're doing the wrong thing. And we'll make sure that you go at the right pace toward the right thing. Um, they'll also say things like, um, uh, my quality will be lower. Um, we, we'll have to redo things. We'll have to make it production. We'll have to stabilize it, make it production ready in the future. Again, that's probably something that you want. If you could get faster feedback from customers, if you could get around your OODA loop quicker, if you could get more information from customers about what you're doing and measure the value and get the value to them faster, I think you'd be happy if uh, you say took six weeks to build something that um, uh, because you were iterating and trying things and throwing it away as you go, than to take three weeks to build the wrong thing. That's almost always true. If it isn't true for you, I'm interested, tell me. But if it is, you have to tell the engineers that because they'll say things quite properly, like, well, if you could just tell me what you want, let me sit in a room for three weeks and don't bother me. Don't keep showing me, get me in front of customers. Just let me sit here and build it and I'll build it for you. It'll be done faster. Isn't that better? And you say, no. And they say, why not? And you say, because I don't know what I want yet. Especially, I don't know what the customers want. So what I want is faster feedback and I want the opportunity to redo things. And therefore I want more flexibility. I want more productivity. I don't want greater predictability and I don't want it necessarily to be faster. Once you tell them that, and often you have to tell a few times and give them examples, then they say, well, yeah, if I were going to do that, then I would have to. And that's the magic words. That's what you want to hear. Because they'll say, yeah, if I were going to do that, then I'd have to build the database tables in a more flexible way. Maybe I would um, start by um, uh, not storing the data. It would just be in the browser and I can show the users, but it won't be stored. And you say, great, this is the kind of thinking. Come back to me with a plan that shows me how you're going to slice into those small pieces and, and let's start rolling it out. Um, when you get that breakthrough, then the engineers really understand what you want them to do. But the problem most often is they don't believe you. It's not that they don't know how. All right, uh, Graham says, hi Graham, wonderful to see you. Uh, guaranteed way to aggravate management. I can either get this done on time or tell you when it's, I'll get it done, but not both. Okay. Um, yes, that would certainly aggravate management. I don't recommend that particular approach. Um, so uh, that what I'm suggesting here is that you abandon the idea of getting it done on time. 
that, that we say, instead of saying, look, I know when this will be done and this is when we can deliver it to the customer. And I know, Graham, in your situation, that this is, this is challenging. You've got customers who really demand from you that you have specific dates and it's going to be done on this date and so on. This is going to be a hard road for you. I'm not suggesting this is easy, but the benefits are high. If you can move up on the tilted slider, even a small amount and get away from um, unreasonable um, expectations for predictability, then you can really unlock a lot of productivity. And you get a quite nice um, uh, virtuous cycle rather than a vicious cycle. You get something that reinforces itself. You get a little more productivity. And people say, my God, I can't believe they got this much done. This is great. How do we do more? And you say, well, can you let me talk to the customers every day instead of every week? Um, can, can we stop having uh, quite so many prediction meetings? And can we start having more demos? And um, then they, assuming that you're, you're continuing to show um, useful progress, that tends to reinforce itself. So uh, Graham can't argue with you at all. That's certainly not the approach to take because the, the management won't like it. What I'd much rather say is I'm going to show you uh, in two days time how far we've got. And then let's talk about how much we need um, uh, to predict when we'll be done because we're going to get a lot done in two days or two weeks or whatever it is. Um, and you're going to be able to see whether we're on track. Can we try that for a short time? Usually, with folks who are reasonable, I, I know Graham's situation, I think his folks would be reasonable. If they aren't, tell them to phone me. Um, and uh, uh, you could certainly try that and say, let's try you know, for this next iteration, for this next thing, for this next delivery. Um, could I try being more visible and less uh, predictable? So that's the argument I'm making to all of you, is that I think you can be much more effective by not lying to yourself. We know that estimates are lies. We know that they're, they're woefully, woefully inadequate. In other parts of our business, like in sales, we make uh, adjustments for it. Strangely, in engineering, maybe because it feels so digital, it feels so binary, it feels black and white, we should be able to know. We can't know. And in fact, we're really bad at knowing. So uh, what I'm suggesting to you is move up on the tilted slider, move away from the desire for control and toward greater productivity. You might move a long way or a short way, but I predict you can move um, uh, at least a little bit. Uh, get that virtuous cycle going. Um, uh, uh, try uh, getting things in front of customers much more frequently than you think you can. Unlock that um, uh, ability that your engineers have, a latent ability uh, to produce things quickly. Uh, and you should have very good results. So um, I've enjoyed chatting to you about this. Great questions from everybody. Really appreciate it. Uh, Aiden, um, uh, anonymous person, Roland, uh, Graham, thank you. Um, and uh, I'll just mention again that uh, we have a forum where we discuss these things. There'll be a follow-up uh, to all of you. Uh, and you can join on the forum and argue and debate and discuss this. Ask me for uh, uh, proof for your toughest examples. By the way, I forgot to mention my bet. So I have a standing bet. If you have a, a feature, you have something you want to build, and engineers or you yourself say, I can't think how I could do that in pieces that are one day long. Uh, come to me. Tell me about it. Uh, we'll talk about it on the forum. If you manage to beat me, if I can't figure out a way to do it, uh, I buy you a beer. I have never had to buy anyone a beer. So I've never lost this bet, but you may be the first one. So um, we could discuss that on the forum for sure. And of course, we have ongoing uh, uh, events and discussions. I'm in Berlin, and I think it's just two weeks. Uh, so looking forward to that. I better buy my plane tickets. Um, so I'm in Berlin talking about tech and product getting um, uh, at cross purposes and going in the opposite directions. What do you do about that? Um, I'll be in Vienna uh, in October. I'll be in Miami in November. Um, there are lots of these virtual events uh, happening, and I'll be back in London, I'm sure, sometime soon. Um, so we're doing ones on um, electric shock. How can you um, shock your team into to doing the right thing and uh, building a strategy uh, that really replaces things like OKRs? Uh, we're talking about um, unleashing chaos. So we're having John Topper, an expert on uh, system administration, come and talk about how to blow up your servers and why that's a good idea. Um, and lots of other exciting things are, are coming up soon. Um, so you can find all of that at, uh, make sure I type this correctly. Uh, nope, I'm not typing it right. Uh, Squirrel Squadron is the name of the group. This is always free. Uh, I never want to sell you anything. Uh, uh, my goal is just to share ideas and thoughts uh, uh, and, and give back to the community that's um, supported me for so long as a, as a consultant, a very happy one. Um, oh, and I should mention, I'm doing a workshop on strategy as well at the end of November. That'll be in the uh, in the follow-up email as well. So if you want to come along, spend a longer time with me and um, replace your, your OKRs with something really effective, uh, come along to that. Um, really appreciate everybody coming. Uh, let's see if there are any final comments that I want to pick up. Oh, Kevin. Kevin's here. Hi. Uh, and I'm just going to uh, see if I can find his comment. There we go. Uh, system architecture has a role to play here. You have to make it cheap to iterate. Compose the system of disposable pieces. Man, is Kevin right? 
Absolutely. You should come, Kevin, to the live stream with uh, John Topper. Um, I think it's October the 8th. I might be wrong. Look on squirrelsquadron.com. But um, John's going to be talking about um, uh, blowing up your servers, trying to you know make them crash and fail and making sure they really are disposable um, and uh, composing them well. That would be a great uh, topic for us to bring up there. Uh, and in iteration and incrementalism don't mean the same thing. Man, you can imagine that's going to be a tweet soon. I'll give, give Roland full credit for that. Um, very thoughtful comment and, and something I very much appreciate. Uh, Stormy uh, says, uh, first time you're here, very informative. Thanks, Stormy. Please join the squadron. Um, you know, I send emails every week. I uh, discuss on the forum. We have these events. So we'd, we'd love to have you uh, discussing more of these things uh, anytime. Wonderful. Great to have all of you. Thank you so much. And um, really appreciate uh, you being here. Come back again next Thursday. Uh, we'll have lots more to talk about. Thanks so much. Take care.